This is Welcome to Mind Wars Forum, Season 2. And we're doing this live this season. Last time we pre-recorded all of our interviews. This we're, uh, year we're doing it a little bit differently. We've got a really exciting summer coming up for you at the Mind Wars Museum. We've got the Blair Centennial coming up on Labor Day. We have dedication to Cecil Roberts. Uh, the building that we're in is going to be dedicated to President Roberts in June. And we're going to have a big event there. Plus, the Mate One Drama Group is going to be doing their play on the Mate One Massacre for the first time since the pandemic began. So look for that in a few weeks. There's also a lot of promotions and some interesting things that's going on with the museum this summer. We know that people are going to want to be getting out uh, now that restrictions are being lifted. So we're hoping that you're going to be able to make your way down to Mate One. Check out the Blair 100 website for centennial information on schedule of events. Also check our website out at wvmindwars.org. You can find out all kinds of information about upcoming events, some promotions that we're doing with some special uh, photographs that were taken by Roger May of our artifacts and some other things. So check out our website, follow us on Facebook, and we're happy that you're joining us here for season two. So let's get right into it. Um, I should have had her on for season one, but uh, didn't get to it. But uh, Denise Giardina is, I think, one of, if not the most beloved living novelist in West Virginia. She is extraordinarily influential for writing about the coal fields, but that doesn't restrict her. Uh, she wrote uh, the book Good King Harry and also Saints and Villains which I don't think we're going to get much into tonight, but she goes beyond just the coal fields in her literature. I was first introduced to Denise when I was a senior in high school, her writing. And that was when Shirley Hall, my English teacher, came in and plopped down a copy of Storming Heaven on the desk. And I remember vividly looking at it and I hadn't heard of the novel yet. And I was just a couple of years into really researching the mind wars in my family's history. And I read it when I was a senior. My English teacher made me read it. In fact, she changed my assignment. Everybody else had to write on something else. She made me especially read Storming Heaven and write an essay on that for her. So uh, obviously I've been hooked ever since and I'm really thrilled to welcome Denise. Uh, Denise, are you there? Let's bring her on. I'm here. Hi, Denise. Hi. How are you? Good. Have you, uh, how have you been doing in the pandemic? Have you been, uh, I haven't talked to you since you joined uh, my Mind Wars class last fall. So how have things been going? Yeah, it's been interesting because the, instead of traveling to school, I've done several Zoom things, which sometimes was actually kind of nice, like in the middle of winter, don't have to go down to Bluefield State, you can just get on the phone, you know, but, um, but it has been really confining. Um, I think I'm lucky because I'm a writer and writers tend to be introverts and we tend to be able to, we, we're used to spending a lot of time by ourselves because mm -hmm. we need, we need that. And so, so in that ways, uh, it, it really wasn't that huge of a, an adjustment for me, but I have missed seeing friends and, 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 uh, you know, getting together uh, and hopefully this summer we're all vaccinated now. So hopefully we're going to be seeing each other some this summer. Yeah, I hope so, too. I hope so, too. You mentioned being at home and having a lot of time to write. Are you are you working on stuff now? I'm actually not, which is the irony, because when I was teaching, uh, you know, I would have killed you know, to have the kind of free time that I've had this past year. But I really have kind of run out of topics, especially that I want to write novels about. Um, uh, and so I've just been spending a lot of time reading. I'm 69 years old and a novel is, you know, takes several years out of your life. And, um, and at this point, there's really just not a subject matter out there that really grabs me, that makes me want to spend the next, you know, three or four years working on it. And um, so I actually would, I would like to write another play. I've written a play uh, and I've spent some time trying to figure out how to get it produced. And of course, the pandemic has thrown a wrench on that but it's also given a little bit of time to think about it and uh and i might write another play but i think i'm i'm just kind of enjoying reading a lot and watching some good tv there's some incredible tv out there streaming right now and um, i'm just enjoying all that so i'm not I, I really almost don't consider myself much of a writer anymore it's like that that was my past life you know i wanted to ask you about that i, I was looking over storming heaven unquiet earth again 
in fact, I was just reading portions of Unquiet Earth today when I was thinking about our talk tonight. And, you know, to me, Denise, it, it's almost like Storming Heaven and Unquiet Earth are the first two parts of a trilogy, kind of, uh, when I was reading it. And I, I don't know that you've ever thought of it in that light, but I thought, you know, it ends with a, a little bit of 1990. And I thought, well, you know, it's been 30 years since then. You've got mountaintop removal. You've got Don Blankenship. You've got all kinds of other interesting things that happen. I almost... If you ever do decide to write another novel, I think going from the '90s to the to the present would be a fascinating look. Yeah, doesn't? I don't think it's. Uh, yeah, I don't think I want to do that though. It's just too huh. too depressing for one thing. <laughs> I mean, a lot. I mean, you know, to think about the 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 hit that the union has taken in terms of membership and stuff, and mm -hmm. and um, and the rise of you know the right and you know. I mean, becoming Donald Trump land, you know, was really, I don't want to write about that. You know, maybe, maybe, maybe <laughs> well, I'll understand that part. A younger, yeah, a younger person out there might want to do that, but I'll leave it to a younger person to do that. Um, okay. Well, if you change your mind, I know there's a lot of people watching that would really like that. Uh, <laughs> if, you, if, if you would try to do that. So for people that don't know you and, and are unfamiliar uh, with your life. Let me get through a couple of little standard things for people that, uh, you know, are just getting familiar with you if they aren't. I imagine most of the people watching now are familiar, but if they aren't, uh, you grew up in McDowell County, right? Right. And little coal camp and you had a younger brother. Right. Three years younger. And so younger brothers are great. Uh, I know this because I am one. Um, <laughs> uh, but you did say that he was bigger than you. I remember I interviewed you nine years ago uh, for our Blair Mountain Journal. I don't know if you even remember that, but we did a phone interview. Yeah, it's been a while. Uh, so I don't, I don't remember the details, but. Yeah. So did you find a lot? How much of your childhood seeped its way into your writing and your early experiences? Um, well, a lot of it. Um, in terms of just have you know the experience of growing up in a coal camp uh, really makes an impression on you, so I was able to and I didn't have to do any research about that at all really hardly, um, so I just had to you know when I did Storming Heaven you're talking about an earlier time period, so I had to imagine my coal camp house without a without you know a bathroom inside you know having a toilet you know a, a toilet out back but um, but that's the way my grandparents my Italian grandparents. Uh, had an outhouse, you know, at their coal camp house. So, so I really, you know, those experiences, I knew what it was like uh, physically for one thing. And, um, and I knew, um, and especially in the unquiet earth, I, I drew on a lot of my childhood experiences for that one. Um, uh, because that was set, you know, the last part of the book is set the, uh, the character Jackie in that book, uh, it's my it's same age as me. And so I drew on, you know, my memories and, you know, what music was popular and, you know, you know who you had a crush mm -hmm. on and um, all that kind of stuff um, to, to write that part of the book as well. So, um, so growing up in a coal camp was immensely helpful to write those books. I remember you saying uh, in our previous interview that, you know, growing up in a coal camp, there's this idea, of course, we, you know, we always deal with stereotypes with West Virginia, but there's this idea that, you know, you grew up with, listening to fiddle music and eating ramps and, uh, and all of this, this idea. And I remember you mentioning you didn't listen to fiddle music. You didn't listen to old timey music or not. I remember you saying that you listened to the Beatles. Yeah. And we didn't have any ramps in McDowell County that I know of either. I don't know if the coal industry killed them or what, but um, I never had a ramp until I was an adult. Um, Me either. And, uh, yeah. I, I mean, I think that's a, more of a Southeastern West Virginia thing. Um, and um, uh, yeah. I, and I, um, I listened to the Beatles and the Dave Clark five and, and, uh, uh the Rolling Stones. And I, 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 my dad listened, my, it's funny, my Italian American dad loved country music, but he didn't really listen so much to old time, but he listened to a lot of, um, Porter Wagner, you know, Dolly Parton, mm -hmm. uh, uh, that kind of music. And, and I made fun of it, you know, cause I was a hip young, you know how you are when you're a teenager, you're just kind of a jerk, you know, and I was just like, you know, making fun of his, you know, his music and stuff, and, 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 I, and not until um, after college, and I came across a 
an album, the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band's Little Circle Be Unbroken. And just absolutely, it just gobsmacked me. It was just like, oh my God, why haven't I not been paying any attention to this music? Uh, I was so pleased that Ken Burns, when he did his thing on country music last year, really featured that album a lot. Um, but that, that was a game changer. And it really became the, um, I always, always had a soundtrack when I was writing my novels. And that album became the soundtrack for, um, for Storming Heaven. Mm -hmm. Um, But then when I was writing The Unquiet Earth about being a teenager in the 1960s and 70s, um, then the soundtrack for that album was was The Beatles and the Rolling Stones. So, um, uh, so, uh, you know, in some ways it was growing up in a coal camp at that time was a lot like being just a typical American teenager at that time. You know, we had mass communication. We had television, you know, um, we were listening to top 40 stuff. We weren't listening to old time mountain music so much. I think that's important that you that you bring that up. It, it was the same thing for me growing up on my mom's side of the family. My grandfather was always in these old timey bands. He was actually briefly in a band in 1937 with Grandpa Jones. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, the, they were in a band just for a few months. I think maybe six months together or something like that. But that's his one was his one claim to fame that he played with Grandpa Jones for a while. But I, I grew up listening with them playing that kind of music when I went over to my grandfather's house, uh, house. And I heard a lot of that, but I didn't like it when I was a kid. I wanted to, uh, I picked up a guitar with 15 and I wanted to be Eddie Van Halen or Jimmy yeah. Hendrix. Uh, I didn't want to be, yeah. uh, I didn't want to yodel like my grandfather did. And it, I, I had to get older before I appreciated it. Yeah. Same way. Yeah. Same thing. Yeah. But it's uh, this it's just this notion when the CNN people were following me around 10 years ago during this march, the protest march that we were doing, when they found out I was a musician, they immediately hoped that I played a banjo so that they could film me playing a banjo. (laughs) And it it just it it set me off, too, when they asked me about it. Can you play a banjo? Can you play any bluegrass? And it it just offered (laughs) some Pink Floyd, but they didn't they didn't go for that. Um, (laughs) But anyway. So well, let's get into you went to Wesleyan, yeah, and that was uh, how how much of a formidable experience was uh, West Virginia Wesleyan? I wonder what it, what was that like back when you were going to school there. Um, it was a very formative experience for me um, uh, because the high school I went to, I had some good individual teachers at, at junior high and high school, especially, I was fortunate, all the English teachers I had, every one of them was really a good teacher, but a lot of other subjects, not so much, and um, uh, Wesleyan was just, you know, they had an excellent history department, which, that was my major, and I I minored in political science, and also took some religion classes, which I turned out, I I, I used when I went to seminary, Um, and uh, my first semester of seminary, I was like, I didn't learn anything, because I'd already learned it all at West Virginia Wesleyan, (laughs) you know, so, um, uh, it was in, uh, you know, philosophy classes and just uh, and there were a number of excellent professors there at that time. I don't know, you know some schools that size change I guess, over the years as they get different professors and so forth. But it was really a good school when I was there. The one criticism I had of it um, was that it was in West Virginia, but uh, about two thirds of the students were from out of state. And um, mm. and even though, I, you know, we West Virginians were in West Virginia, they made all kinds of fun of us. Uh, mm-hmm. and, uh, in fact, some of the professors, a, a, a few times I can remember, uh, had to just confront students and say, look, number one, you're in their home. <laughs> number mm. two, you don't make fun of the way they talk. And number three, they're better students than you are. So shut up, basically, was what, <laughs> what a couple of faculty said to them. That's uh, so, funny. Uh, so, but, but there was a defensiveness, those of us from West Virginia, we had to kind of put up with um, the only the out of state students that I bonded with were, were from Western Maryland, which is interesting. Um, and th- because they they actually had often been to West Virginia and they liked West Virginia. Uh, but um, some of the kids from New Jersey and stuff were like, oh, God, <laughs> Pitt- and Pittsburgh, they were the worst. Uh, but um, so and the school really did not provide any Appalachian studies at that time, um, which I was critical of in the student newspaper. But um, um, but other than that, it was an excellent school and it really. Uh, academically and intellectually really shaped me, I think, um, and taught me a lot. You mentioned the letter that you wrote. I should have uh, 
made a made a picture of it so I could put it up on the screen, but uh, but I didn't do that. Catherine Antolini, you know, who was with me in the, at the Mind Wars class, she's the head of the history department there. She looked that that article up that uh, you were, uh, you know, complaining that uh, there were a lot of things left out uh, of West Virginia history when you when you were being taught this and that needed to be corrected. Yeah. And, uh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I took a West Virginia history class and, and the mind wars were never mentioned, not once. Uh, and the textbook had a little bit, but not. it was very vague. I don't remember it being very informative at all. And uh, the professor never talked about it. Um, and that was that was the one class on, uh, of on every discipline. That's the only class at Weston at that time that dealt with anything remotely connected to West Virginia. Uh, so it was pretty pathetic. Uh, and uh, I really didn't learn about the mind wars till I graduated from there. And I did learn research skills at Wesleyan and then started to do research on my own. Uh, and that's when I learned about the mind wars. But it wasn't at West Virginia Wesleyan. I think that's different now. Obviously, obviously, you taught the class there. Um, yeah, so. yeah, the, it, it was my first go around teaching uh, with our, our first mind wars class. Students really liked it and uh, got a lot of positive comments from uh, from the students, and they really liked it when you came on. It, it, they, it's I guess one advantage of the Zoom system, as tedious as it can be, is I can bring in guests. Uh, so David Corbin came along, uh, and you did a class, and it, it was. Kenzie came along and gave everybody a little virtual tour of the museum. And so, so it has that advantage of it. But something that you were talking about just a second ago that I found really interesting. So you didn't learn about it when you grew up in McDowell County. No, which is sad. And then when you went to college where you would expect to learn something uh, about it, you don't get it there either. Yeah, exactly. Where did you first hear about it? Yeah, I... I um, I've tried to remember that exactly. And I'm pretty sure this is where it was. Um, there used to be a bookstore in Charleston called Major's Bookstore. Uh, mm -hmm. It was on Hale Street. It's not, it's not there anymore, um, obviously. And um, they had a section in the back of the store which is, of just West Virginia books. There was just maybe a couple of shelves of West Virginia books. And um, and so I was perusing it because I was wanting to learn more about the history of my own state, even though I'd taken that class. And um and I saw this, this this title jumped out at me because it was in it was a black cover with white letters. It said "Bloodletting in Appalachia," and I was like, "My God, is this like vampires or something?" <laughs> and, I, and I pulled it out, and it was by Howard Lee, who was the Attorney General at the time of the Mine Wars. And I'm like, "What the hell is this?" And you know, I was looking through these pictures, and you know, the tent colonies and the machine guns, and um, uh, and. I immediately bought it and took it home, and, and and I'm pretty sure that's the first. It's been a long time ago, but I'm pretty sure that's the first I ever heard of the Mind Wars. And of course, that's a real immersion. That book is just um, a, a classic. And the thing that was interested me about it as a historian was that uh, Howard B. Lee was the Attorney General. He clearly did not like either side in the Mind Wars. I mean, he thought the miners were really you know rough and everything, but he didn't like the coal operators either. So he so you know you knew you knew as a historian you were getting an unvarnished opinion about something, you know, which you could judge for yourself. But he wasn't trying to snowball anybody in terms of saying, oh, the miners were all heroic and then the, the mine guards were evil or the mine guards were all heroic and the miners were evil. He wasn't doing that. He just didn't like anybody. So, yes. so it was, um, but just the events. And then when I looked at the events and cataloged them and the dates, and then I went to the cultural center and looked at microfilm, uh, at the Charleston Gazette, for example, and there it would be, you know, the, the, um, there it was on the front page and, mm -hmm. and including, um, I'll never forget the the moment that I looked at the microfilm with the date uh, of the New York Times, the date of the of Blair Mountain, and it was on the front page. I mean, the headline, top headline across the front page of the New York Times. Um, uh, and um, then it hit me that what I, you know, something that I'd never heard of was big news in the country in 1921. I mean, it was national news. So, yeah. so that's where it started was Major's Bookstore. Yeah, it's a, that's a Howard B. Lee's book. I think it, it was the first book I read uh, on the Mind Wars. 
And you're right, how he ends it. He, he says he goes to this old church in the coal fields, and, and there's a preacher up there talking, and he talks about, says, you know, everybody's failed us. The unions failed us. The companies have failed us. The politicians have failed us. So he, he spreads the blame around. Yeah, I do like the fact that he knew several of the individuals, and he saw several of the events. You know, he actually was at uh, the Sid Hatfield trial for a couple of days. He actually saw the rally on August the 7th at the Capitol with Mother Jones and Frank Keeney. And then he interviewed Frank Keeney and Harold Houston and other people later. Yeah. So it, it does have that value to it. It's, yeah, that, that's one thing I learned as a you know, history major at Wesleyan. They, they emphasize to us the importance of primary sources. Uh, I mean, that you know, it's not just somebody else's hearsay. It's somebody who actually saw it and talked to people. Who, if they didn't see it themselves, they talked to the actual people who saw it. So, so it was an incredible uh, resource for me. I've still got it on my bookshelf somewhere. Um, yeah, I do too. And and it's I you had the black cover also, but I think it's wore off now. It's just oh, it's the, <laughs> just the hardback uh, from that old McLean Printing Company. Yeah. So was Storming Heaven part of a way to rectify this? I remember in our last interview, you mentioned that Storming Heaven. You said you chose the mine wars to write about because we fought back. The, the, yeah. Those three words. Yeah, that I mean, that was what, you know, the, the line I was fed growing up, not by my parents, but um, but by the culture in general uh, and the media, was that we were a bunch of backward, ignorant hillbillies. And, you know, we were just waiting for JFK and LBJ to ride along on their on their horses and save us ignorant hillbillies from, you know, with their war on poverty and stuff. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, But in the meantime, we were just running around barefoot and, and uh, uh ignorant <laughs> and uh and we have never done anything to try to help our own condition and and that was just a lie that's right. just a lie and i, I wanted to tell the, the real story of what had actually happened so that was really my motivation uh was reclaiming my history which i was learning about for the first time um and but then there was this perfect storm of you know, all of a sudden um i was writing storming heaven and uh, and um public television came out with this documentary, Even the Heavens Weep. And um, that was the first thing I think that ever in popular culture that I can remember in West Virginia, where actually, you know, West Virginia could see this on TV. And it's like, whoa, I didn't hear, hear about this before. And so people were talking about that. And um, and then I was writing Storming Heaven. And then and unbeknownst to me, John Sales was writing Mate One. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and David Corbin was writing some of his books. And um, and they all kind of came out about the same time. And there was yeah. just this flowering of all of a sudden, everybody knew about this stuff. And then public TV made some more documentaries. And um, uh, and it just, you know, then American Experience came in a few years ago and, and did, did the Mind Wars. And um, it just kind of took off. That was that period back in the late 70s and early 80s when it just kind of all started coming together. Um, I yeah. think that was, that was a period when many people were starting to learn their heritage. That's the period when roots came out and African-Americans were starting to learn about their own history for the, for maybe the first time. And um, Appalachian people, same thing. We're starting to say, what about our history? You know, what, what was it really like? Cause we never heard about it in school. Right. Um, yeah. There, there was this little uh, kind of mini mind wars renaissance from say 87 to about 91 92, uh, you had, you know, Lon Savage's book also came out around that yeah, time. That's another one, yeah. And uh, Golden Seal had a book uh, about the Mind Wars, a kind of a compilation of articles that Ken Sullivan edited. And Mary Lee Settle's uh, novel, The Scapegoat, came out around that time in the early 80s, something mid 80s. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people don't remember that book. Uh, that's that's unfortunate, but a lot of people don't don't uh, remember Scapegoat. Yeah, I think it's one of her better ones, actually. Yeah, yeah, good depiction of Mother Jones. Yeah, in fact, uh, I I somehow it must have come out before Storming Heaven. It must have come out when I was writing Storming Heaven because I read it and I remember thinking, you know, there's no way I'm going to try to. I was at the time I was trying to decide how to how to use Mother Jones, where to put her into the story. And I just thought, you know, I'm not going to try to touch Mother Jones now because Mary Lee Settle, that was the quintessential Mother Jones right there. So mm -hmm. I just decided to just do an end run around Mother Jones and, and, uh, uh, and you know, leave her out pretty much, which she shouldn't do. But I thought Mary Lee Settle had already captured her. So, um, 
Yeah, well, uh, I understand that choice. Uh, you also chose for the most of the people to to come up with fictitious names. Yeah. Um, for most of the people, and uh, also the places too. I love the the uh, the irony of Justice County. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that still, it, and maybe it shouldn't make me smile, but but it still makes me smile. Just the, that it's you chose you chose justice. Yeah. Uh, in a county that has anything but that. Right. You know, there's a little town called Justice actually right on the border of Magdal and Mingo. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's in Mingo, but it's right there on the border. So I thought that would be, and I started to have a character say, there ain't no justice in Justice County, <laughs> but I didn't do it because I thought that was a little bit over the top. But uh, yeah. But I picked the name because it's kind of a, I kind of took Mingo and Magdal and converged them together to make Justice mm -hmm. County. And, um, and I picked that name because I like that name of that town and it's obviously symbolic. So, um, uh, yeah, I, my first draft, I was trying to keep the places where they actually happened. So I had Estelle in there and I had um, uh, uh, Keystone and I had, uh, uh, you know, Paint Creek, Cabin Creek and Mingo County. And, and it was just like I was, you know, I had like 400 pages and I was trying to chase these characters all over the place. And I still hadn't got, you know, ha you know, a quarter of the way into the plot, you know, and it was so I really, you know, had the light bulb come on in my head and I realized this is uh, why Faulkner, you know, created Yachtnabotapa County because yeah. he had the freedom to run Yachtnabotapa County and put things <laughs> where he wanted to. Right. Uh, and so instead of having to chase these characters all over the state of West Virginia, I could put them in this one county, basically. And um, and so that's that's what I did. And um, uh, Faulkner was a big, well, I, I thought, Somebody asked um, if there were books that influenced my writing, and um, and William, William Faulkner probably is the answer to that. Um, mm -hmm. that. The reason I have multiple narrators is because I read As I Lay Dying, and Faulkner pioneered that. Uh, and um, uh, and then, uh, like I said, his, his creation of a fictional county that he could then make his own little universe, kind of. Um, uh, that's also from Faulkner. So, big um, Faulkner fan, huh? Yeah. Okay, yeah. I think when when they when they brought up that recent Hemingway documentary, I said, "No, no, Ken Burns, you should do Faulkner. He's more important." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, a lot of people. Did you say was as I lay dying? Is that the book specifically? Yeah. 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 yeah multiple narrators. Yeah, his his narration is uh, is that stream of consciousness is always pretty interesting. Um, I th I still think. The, the thing that resonates with me the most about Storming Game to this day, even when I read it for the first time as a teenager, was your last sentence. The company still owns the land. Yeah. And it still, I mean, it, the company still owns the land. Yeah. We, we can talk about doing all kinds of stuff with former mountaintop removal sites, but as long as these companies still own that land, we're still limited on what we can do. Yeah, the economy's never gonna. There's never gonna recover down there until the land, until we somehow get the land back, and that's just reality. Yeah, and I say this. I say this jokingly because I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Bernie Sanders supporter. Yeah, uh, but um, but I also consider myself somewhat of a capitalist. I would say to somebody who who considers themselves a capitalist, then you should be against absentee land ownership because because if you're a capitalist and you want to start a business in McDowell County, forget it. There's mm -hmm. no place to put it. I mean, there's right. places you can put it, but but you wouldn't own it. So, um, so why bother? And, and you're not going to have any kind of a capitalist thriving economy uh, in Southern West Virginia until the land ownership situation changes. Right. And, and, and I wrote that sentence uh, that you mentioned, you know, in 1986, and this is 2021, and it's still the same. Yeah, yeah. Well, when we were when we were fighting to get the permits stopped on the Blair Mountain battlefield, one of those permits, Camp Branch, went in the middle of the battlefield. That permit was first issued in 1991, and so the the companies had that land. It's one of the great ways that they prevent any kind type of economic diversification is they put permits, and they get them decades, in, the, in this case, decades before they even planned on mining anything so that they could put a lock on that land and mm -hmm. you can't do anything else with it. You can't use it for anything else. And so the companies can just sit on it. And obviously we don't tax them like we should so that they yeah. to get them to do something with it. So 
it's it, it's still the I think the most powerful line in the book because you have all that bloodshed, all that fighting, all that organizing, all that strife, and the company still owns the land. Yeah. That's yeah. It. And uh, to keep things on a positive note, let's talk about Unquiet Earth for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to keep it all cheerful. A happy you know. note, yeah. The, uh, uh, you know, I was reading through that again. I, there's something I've always wanted to ask you about this book. Because uh, a lot of the writing that you do and, you know, some of the writing that I've done and for the three or four people that have read it, uh, uh, I write against stereotypes. You know, you we try to dispel stereotypes. You've got two main characters who are first cousins. Exactly. <laughs> and they become lovers. Yeah. So that, that, tell me about that choice. <laughs> well, it wasn't really a choice in some ways. The characters made the choice. Um, but part of the problem is that the ending that you mentioned of Storming Heaven, um, I would like to take that back. I'd like to keep the part about the land. But um, uh, but there's earlier in that little uh, coda, um, there's a character who, who says, um, uh, talks about his cousin, his cousin, Rachel, who was like a sister to him. Mm -hmm. and, uh, <laughs> so, um, so I started writing The Unquiet Earth and these characters popped up uh, and um, and I realized they, they weren't, they were, they were first cousins, but they were not like, she wasn't like a sister to him. She, he was in love with her. Um, but, and I've gotten some, you know, I, you know, every now and then, especially at colleges, uh, I get some, some criticism from students who, who feel like that's a stereotype and they feel like I'm putting down Appalachian culture because that is, you know, if you get online, you know, and you read comments, there's always somebody putting out crap about how you all, you know, marry your sisters and stuff, stuff like that. Um, here's what we don't stop and think about. And, and I really, you know, I tried to make them not fall in love with each other, but I got writer's block because they kept insisting they were in love with each other. And so I had to make a choice. Either I, either I keep this stereotype or I don't write the book. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, and I realized a couple of things. Um, one is that, um, in Pride and Prejudice, Mr. Darcy was supposed to marry his first cousin, you know, and, but he didn't marry her because he fell in love with Elizabeth Bennet instead. But that mm -hmm. was typical in upper class English society to marry your first cousin to keep all the money and property in the family. And that was just taken for granted. And nobody, you know, called them hillbillies, you know, for that. Um, right. Uh, it wasn't considered to be incestuous. And in fact, in most states, it's perfectly legal in this country as well. Um, and so, you know, if, if people have a problem with that, then I'd say, I say, look at Mr. Darcy, <laughs> you know, yeah. um, or and, the uh, Habsburgs, the Romanovs. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and, oh. and, you know, Queen Victoria's family. Um, but mm -hmm. the other thing I realized is that, that in fact, that stereotype was going to drive these two people apart because Rachel buys into the fairy stereotype. She's the woman in the, in the relationship. And, um, and she, she, she gets to the point where she can't handle it anymore partly because the man she's in love with is difficult, but partly because that stereotype. So in a sense, that stereotype kills that relationship. Um, so that's the way I decided to come at it. And um, so it's in there for better or for worse. I, I don't really have any regrets about it at all. Mm -hmm. What do you think about, uh, you know, of course you've got Buffalo Creek in, in this, which was yeah. one of the more powerful parts uh, of the, of the novel. And you, you just, if you already know the story of Buffalo Creek and you're reading it as I did when I was reading it for the first time, you know, you can just feel it coming up and it's almost like the dam bursting is a culmination of like all the, the rotten stuff that had happened uh, in the coal fields and, and to the people of Appalachia. That's the way it, it felt in reading it. And uh, one that, and I didn't get to finish reading all of the rereading of the book because it had been a few years since I've read it. But one of the characters she ends up in Pittsburgh, right? She ends up in Pittsburgh, yeah. Um, and and um, you know, I, in an early draft that, that that took place on Buffalo Creek itself in 1972, which is when Buffalo Creek happened. Right. Uh, but again, I fixed. I decided, you know, there were no characters from Buffalo Creek. Uh, and so the reader wouldn't be relating closely to Buffalo Creek. And so I switched it to Blackberry Creek, the fictional 
place. And I moved it to 1992 so that it could end the book. Cause I, cause you really don't have a Buffalo Creek in the middle of a book because you know, that's, mm -hmm. I mean, that's, what do you do after that? So, uh, right. right. Uh, and really, um, to me, on Quiet Earth is uh, the end, the end game of, of the coal fields. Um, you know, I left the coal fields and, um, I, I, and I went to Washington, D.C. and I went to Durham, North Carolina. And, um, and I wrote this, I wrote it in Durham when I was living in Durham and partly still questioning if I'd ever come back or not. Uh, and so I send Jackie to Pittsburgh with that same question, you know, can I ever come back again? And, um, and to me, I was writing about the loss uh, to me, you know, McDowell County is my home. I lived there till I was 13. Then we moved up to the Eastern part of Kanawha County, it, which is still not, it's not as hardcore as McDowell County, but still was at the, in those days was a, a coal mining area. Mm -hmm. and, um, so, and so much of Southern West Virginia is gone. I mean, I go to back to, to McDowell County now and I, I can't recognize that. In fact, I can't go back anymore because it's too painful. Mm -hmm. uh, so much is gone. It's, it's like, it's dead to me almost. Um, and I just remember the way it was and it's not there anymore. And, and so what happens at the end of the unquiet earth is the destruction of my home basically. And, and, and by, by extension, the home of everybody that grew up in Southern West Virginia. Um, um, it's just not, uh, and somebody who's young now won't understand that perhaps. Um, because they only know what's there now, but um, it was such a different place and such a vibrant place. And um, uh, you sometimes so my, feel like, of my morning, I was my morning, the loss of the coal fields, really. Do you sometimes feel like when you drive back there that you're like driving through ruins? Uh, it's, uh, do you get to feel like almost as though you're, 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 uh, dry, you're like if you could travel through Italy like 10 years after the fall of Rome or something when, when, you know, the houses are kind of un, in ill oh, yeah. repair. Or... Yeah. And so a lot of that's even gone now. But um, a few years ago, um, Chris Hedges, who was a war correspondent for the New York Times, who covered the war in Bosnia, Herzegovina, or whatever, you, how you pronounce it. Um, her, uh, um, he then did a freelance book that was partly about uh, McDowell County. And um, uh and so I met him when he was coming, was here to do some research and, and he took a driving tour down there and he said, God, it was just like Bosnia. You know, it looks like Bob, it look, looks like it's been bombed out, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, you know, I last lived there, um, in 1979 and 80 for a year in Keystone. And, um, it was already falling apart then feeling yeah. that way. And, um, that's even worse. Now, the last time I went, I went back was when my uncle died about five years ago, and I just haven't been able to go back since. Um, it was hard then just to mm -hmm. see how much it had, had changed. Uh, sorry, I've got a cat on my lap. <laughs> I was trying to. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I understand. I remember when uh, you were giving some advice to my students and some students were asking about, should I, should we stay or should we go? And And you said, you know, go, go see the world and then maybe come back if you want to. But you encourage the young people to leave West Virginia for nothing else to explore and get out of your little bubble that you grew up in. Yeah, I, exactly. I tell every, you know, any young person that asks me that question, that's what I say. It was really important for me to do that. I lived five, five and a half years in D.C. I lived uh, three years in Durham, North Carolina, and um, the, the, it was an invaluable experience both times. And it helped me get perspective on this place and also made me realize what I missed about this place. I mean, I lived in Durham. Uh, first of all, uh, the racial situation there is just, uh, it may have improved a little bit now, I don't know, but it was, this was 1988 to 91. It was very segregated. I mean, there was, there was you know, the black half of town and the white half of town. And you, know, you didn't switch from one to the other real easily. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and I look at the west side of Charleston, which is like totally integrated. And I'm like, you know, <laughs> we're doing a little bit better in some ways than, than they were. And, um, and also there are no Italians down there. I'm like, where's my pizza? Where, where's the spaghetti? You know, where's, uh, you know, where's my, where's my paisans? You know, there was just no immigration down there right? Uh, of that kind at, at that time. So, um, so there were things I missed and you realize what you miss when you go away, I think. Uh, and, um, uh, and you can bring your experiences with you then that you had there, but come back and, um, and contribute here. I've still found that I can contribute here in a way that I could not do in DC or in Durham. Right. Yeah. Uh, 
So I don't, re- I don't regret leaving. I think it was a good experience and I don't regret coming back. That's good. That's good. Now I've got to ask you one question. Um, Vicki Evans, uh, she uh, teaches English at Southern where I teach. Um, she had an office a uh, couple doors down from me for a couple of years ago, but she's on a different campus now. When we first met and I, I brought you up, uh, this was right when we were about to do the protest march and everything. And she was talking to me kind of in support of what we do. I had professors and other people that worked at the school I work at that would come to my office and like stick their head in the door and say, I'm fully behind you, but don't tell anybody who said that <laughs> <laughs> and then run off. Uh, but Vicki, uh, Vicki was not that way. Vicki, she of course is an avid reader and she's a huge fan of your books and I mentioned you and she immediately, she put her hand on her heart and looked up. She says, Oh, kudzu Jesus. I love kudzu Jesus. Uh, <laughs> and every, time, <laughs> every time I mention you to her, she kudzu Jesus. She like looks up at the sky and puts her hand on her heart. Um, I, well, I always told her she got to get, she needs to get a, I heart kudzu Jesus bumper sticker. Um, well, tell her kudzu Jesus. She's in the right County because kudzu Jesus appeared in Logan County. That's, yeah, that's what I mean. I didn't, I didn't, th- I didn't dream this up. Uh, I opened up the Charleston Gazette, and the front page had this picture of this tree with covered with kudzu, and people had decided it was it was Jesus, and yeah. it, it did look like it looked like it's kind of like the man of the mountain in New Hampshire, you know, that looks like that kind of man's head. You know, it looked like the uh, the head of a man with maybe a beard in profile, and and uh, and and so people were starting to pilgrimage to this. I can't remember where in Logan County it was, but. The Gazette photographer had taken this picture of it, and there had, there was a little story, and uh, said the local preacher was getting people to come and pray at it. You know, yeah. and I'm, think, I'm thinking, you know, uh, and that's why I haven't one of the characters say, "Well, it could be the Smith brothers off the cough drop box or something." You know, it could be. <laughs> uh, but I was also thinking, you know, when the kudzu keeps growing, it's not going to look like Jesus for very long. You know, but um, but I, I'm not making this up. That was in the Gazette, uh, and um, and and I just thought that would make a great scene and uh so I'm, i created the chapter in fact i created the character of the preacher I, I really created him in order to just play that part you know to um uh and um then then i have it was just a kind of a fun it's probably one of the funniest and most fun chapters i've ever written where uh the local catholic priest is in trouble and the local his local friends who are not catholics but they want to support him so they pretend to be catholics when the bishop comes to visit <laughs> and one of them starts speaking in tongues and and it was just uh it was just a hoot to write um uh and also i think i, I love the unquiet earth i think it's my favorite book in some ways because you have this humor and humanity of stuff like that and then at the end of the book it all gets wiped out you know yeah. it's just it's just um it's all gone you know and that preacher and his church get get blown away you know so um uh it's a i think it's my f- most um full book in some ways yeah, it's definitely epic in the amount of years and the times that, that it goes through. I mean, it starts in the Great Depression, so it's already, yeah. um, you know, and I, I like the legacy uh, characters, uh, the, the one girl that is uh, daughter of the, the fictitious Sid Hatfield uh, character or a version of him. Uh, and I like it that they're friends with each other and they talk about, you know, their their families and their legacy and how that resonates throughout generations. Um, yeah. it, it's just a great book. I do want to mention or ask about um, religion. You write very well about religion. You know, I grew up going to church. Uh, uh, almost, I mean, it's Appalachia. So a lot of us grew up going to a church or, or being around that uh, country church atmosphere. And I think that you cover it really well in your, in your writings, in your book. What do you think, how do you think uh, Christianity has changed in the mountains in the last century? You know, in Fred Barkey's book, uh, he did, he's done a lot of research to show how a lot of Christians off of, of company property, like Church of Christ and Disciples of Christ and Church of God in the early 20th century, a lot of them were socialists. Yeah, and, and holiness people. Some of the some of the leaders of some of the strikes were holiness preachers. Uh, there was something about the holiness movement, you know, where where, you, where this, the Holy Spirit comes down on you and you speak in tongues, and and that Holy Spirit can also, you know, you know, put you on a picket line, you know. So, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, uh, I think the, the the way it's changed is is the same all over the country. Uh, we, we've had this uh, 
I don't think religion in West Virginia now is really any different from any, anywhere else in the country. You've got this evangelical wing that has turned pretty conservative, uh, and I think you know we can we can thank uh, the Jerry Falwells and the Pat Robertsons for that. Um, mm-hmm. and, um, uh, and so we've lost a lot of that early um, holiness type um, uh, movement, and. Um, um, but we've also then we've had uh, I mean I write a, a bit especially in the Unquiet Earth about the Jesuits who came in and the, the nuns who came in who did a lot of social justice work here in the in the sixties and seventies and eighties mm-hmm. uh, really important work uh, not so much in the last couple of decades but um, but in the sixties through the eighties were a really high point of Catholic social justice movement in in West Virginia and Kentucky and. Um, uh, and so um, it's complicated. It's complicated. It keeps changing. Um, and um, I, as a Christian myself, I think um, that's to be expected. And uh, um, and I think Christianity points me to look for the places I find it in un- unexpected places. You know, the weak and the, um, uh, the people who are not supposed to be holy are the people who often are. Right. <laughs> uh, and uh, that follows everything jesus said i said so um uh yeah uh, uh, yeah i imagine a lot of a lot of evangelicals today would probably not stop and talk to the woman at the well um yeah american woman uh and things like that yeah it's it's a long topic to to discuss and maybe someday we can have a a more in-depth discussion on that but I, i i do think it's fascinating how uh, Christianity has changed in, in the mountains and less. I mean, there's still uh, obviously there there are variants between denominations and, and all this. And you also have um, churches are declining in population also right. significantly. It's mostly that's older all over people. The country too. Yeah, yeah, that's all over the country. That's just yeah. not not just here. Yeah. So you actually did some activism yourself. I, I know we're we, we're going kind of long on time here, but we're having an interesting conversation. Uh, you ran for governor in 2000. I remember that uh, when you were running for governor. I remember you with your little dog. Um, <laughs> My dear Phyllis. I miss her. Yes. Uh, going around. Uh, just what are some of your reflections? It's 21 years later. What are your thoughts and reflections on that many years past for the Mountain Party? You ran for the Mountain Party, right? Yeah, and that's that actually might be my biggest regret in some ways because I knew at the time that a third party was not going to be viable, and I don't think it is. And I think I'm kind of surprised it's lasted as long as it has. And I know there are a few hardy souls out there, bless their hearts, who are keeping it going, but uh, I don't think it's ever going to be. Um, uh, you know, I, I really, um, if I had it to do over again, I think I probably would run in the Democratic primary rather than doing third party. It would have been a lot easier um, uh, and, and would probably have been just as effective. But I really did it to, to talk about mountaintop removal because mm-hmm. I knew it was not going to be talked about by either Bob Wise or Cecil Underwood. But it, I don't think either one, even though you know, I found out personally later um, uh, from a relative of Underwood that he was not happy. He didn't particularly like mountaintop removal. And um uh, and I know Bob Wise didn't either, but he didn't want to touch it politically. And, right. um, uh, so I felt the only way it was, go- and it wasn't on the national radar yet. And I think the thing I felt good about and still feel good about is that because I ran, uh, there was a thing on CNN, and, uh, Judy Woodruff, uh, interviewed me. Um, and, uh, that's back when she was with CNN rather than PBS. And, um, she came to Charleston, did an interview. Uh, the Washington Post sent a reporter down. They did a big article about it. Um, there was a big article of all places in the Economist of London, um, and um, and it got it was on CNN internationally. A friend of mine went to Spain, and, and her cab driver asked her where she was from, and and she said West Virginia. And he she said, Oh, I, I see the woman with her little dog in the parade or something. <laughs> he had seen the, something on CNN international, and uh, so it's like you know some cab driver in Spain, you know, <laughs> learned about mountaintop removal, hopefully. So, um, uh, but little, I mean, it didn't help, but at least it did raise awareness for the issue, which, um, uh, and I'm, I think it was worth the effort just to do that, actually. Um, I, you know, I, I think but, those things built uh, built momentum over time. You know, you had to have those first people like you, like Jimmy Weekly. Um, in the late 90s and early 2000s, and then Larry Gibson and, and uh, Julian Martin 
some of those original uh, folks that, that stepped out when when nobody else would, and that had to happen. For yeah, uh, it's, it's hard, you know. It's I really kind of burned out too. Actually, in two thousand one, um, uh, uh, you know, after the election was over, um, uh, and then um, uh, you know, I went to a couple of demonstrations. I think afterwards, but really, my heart wasn't. I just wasn't. Uh, I, so I was, became much less active. I just, um, it, you know, it like I think burnout was a good term. It just, you know, I felt burned out politically uh, after going at this for two years, um, high high maintenance. You know, I just couldn't mm -hmm. do anymore. So it was like I just needed to step aside and let other people pick up the ball and run with it. But um, uh, so you had people like Larry Gibson who were who continued to carry it forward, and um, uh, and the folks at OVEC. Um, but um, yeah, I got to the point where I just couldn't do it anymore. Yeah, yeah. But you did come and you gave you gave a talk at uh, on the last day of our Blair Mountain protest march. That was ten years ago this summer. Yeah. And I remember that. Um, any reflections on that week? Or and I know you didn't participate uh, the whole week, but uh, you came early. I remember Sunday morning you came. Uh, to our little headquarters in Marmette. Yeah, I, I had some health issues um, a few years early. I had a couple of strokes, and I just did not uh, see myself walking in, in the heat right. for any distance at all. Uh, you had to call an ambulance probably. So, uh, uh, so I didn't try to, do, but I did try to come to Marmette, and I came to the end, and, um, uh, and so I didn't have to walk. I could just be there. You know? mm -hmm. so, um, yeah, it, it was important. Um, and it continues to be important. It's not over. It's 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 ending. I think it's ending. Thank God. But uh, I, I don't think it's over yet. Um, There's still things to do. There's still yeah. things to do. Yeah. Definitely. Well, I want to uh, open up. I believe we have some questions. I know that I've, I've kept you a little bit longer than what I said I was going to. Okay. Here we go from Walt. Uh, what relevance do you feel preservation of Blair Mountain has to the future of West Virginia? And this is me. You want me to answer the question? Yeah, sure. It's yeah. Like, okay. Yeah. Okay. I guess, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. I think any history uh, that can be can be preserved should be. I mean, this would uh, solve the question of why I, as a child, never heard of Blair Mountain if I could go to Logan County, you know, which I did as a child visiting relatives and stuff, if I could know that it was there, if I saw signs, you know, you know, the brown signs saying, you know, Blair Mountain and, and the roadside plaques and all that kind of, you know, any, anything that could be preserved should be. Uh, mm -hmm. And, um, you know, anything that relates to people having stood up for themselves and spoken back and fought back, um, is important for any future issue in West Virginia. And I'm sure, you know, I'm 69 years old, so I'm sure I want to see, live to see a lot of it. But in the future, there's going to be a lot of stuff still that people in West Virginia are going to have to stand up to uh, and speak out about. And um, and so it's just an example of that, that so that our children can know as they grow up um, uh, that they had that in their background. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Walt. Walt, if you want to know what I think about it, read my book. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've got a whole book on it, so you can. Uh, Mary says, "Opening chapters of Storming Heaven when the grandfather is shot, killed for not giving up their land. Did that really happen?" Yeah, that that and that type of thing happened, you know, several times. Um, it wasn't always being shot, although that did happen. Um, uh, it, it was sometimes it was. Um, for example, my great grandfather being put in jail after he got in a bar fight, <laughs> and uh, not being bailed out until he agreed to sign over the mineral rights to his land, uh, and um, uh, and so and, uh, you know that type of thing. I did a lot of oral history type stuff when I was I was living in Eastern Kentucky part of the time when I was doing the research for Storming Heaven too, and um, mm -hmm. uh, you know people would tell me their family stories like this is how we lost our land, and um, uh, in some cases, and there also that's been documented in in some history books, you know, there were people who were killed um, uh, mm -hmm. because they wouldn't give up the mineral rights. And um, that happened several times in eastern Kentucky, for example. Um, so, yeah, it happened. 
some places, <laughs> uh, different points. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There were a number of instances, a lot of different ways in which they took the land. And uh, that was one of the Matt says, I'd love to know if your West Virginia novels have found an international audience and what their response has been. Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, the, the only the sad thing to me is they, they've never been published in other countries, uh, but people have still gotten a hold of them. Um, and in fact, uh, there's a guy in Toronto, Canada right now has the rights to Storming Heaven. Uh, and wants to make a limited TV series now. Well, uh, he's just now started trying to raise money to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know if he'll succeed or not, but here's a guy in Canada who wants to do a TV series based on Storming Heaven. And, um, uh, and so, so yeah, they have, they continue to, especially Storming Heaven has probably had more impact in terms of reaching out, uh, to, to, um, than, than any of the other books have. Um, so, um, yeah, I think it's been positive. And I've also had people, uh, you know, I get contacted now and then by media from other countries who uh, have been told about the book and, they, and told to contact me because I wrote this book that about such and such. So, uh, so yeah, there is, there is an audience. I would love to see some Italian. I would love to see it in Italy, uh, in Sicily, you know, where your family's from. It would be great to, to see it over there. Yeah. What does Jonah say here? What relevance do you see the recent teacher strikes having in regards to West Virginia history? Oh, I, they, they were very exciting, I thought. And um, I'm very proud to say, by the way, that, uh, that the president of one of the teachers unions, uh, Fred Albert, was a, a good buddy of mine in high school. We graduated together in high school. And um, I was very proud of him and what he's done. Um, Oh, I think it energized not just the state, but the nation. I mean, you saw how other teachers responded. And um, and this was what I'm talking. I think uh, I think the cause, especially of the teacher strikes, um, the subject of labor and labor unions has been revitalized to a great extent, more so than any time since. I mean, I think the the nadir was when um, Reagan broke the air traffic controllers union, PATCO, in the 1980s. Uh, and from and that was like a turning point. It was for, for for unions. It just went down, down, down after that. And I think what the what the West Virginia uh, teacher strike did was was make a similar impact on the national consciousness uh, in a more positive way, and, and maybe has has kick started what I hope is going to be a, a um, renewed interest in 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 labor and help help working people can stand up for themselves uh, because that's what it's all about. It's not about um, you know, it, it's about working people having a say in their own lives. Um. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you're right. I thought the reporter, labor reporter, interviewed me like four or five months before the teacher strikes, and I said that the labor movement in West Virginia is on hospice, uh, and I was wrong. Yeah. <laughs> I was, uh, yeah. I was, I did not see that coming. That yeah. suddenly there would just be this huge groundwell support for the teachers uh, and that they would be so quick to jump on to and be so supportive. A lot of conservative teachers, too, were very uh, into that. So I think that was really interesting. Do we have any more or is that it? I don't see another one popping up here. Okay. Well, I think that about does it for us. Uh, there's a lot more that we could talk about, but I, I really enjoyed uh, the conversation, Denise. Thank you so much. I, for did, I did too. It was a lot of fun. Good, good. I'm glad you had it. And you've got to come down and you got to let me know when you're coming down to make one uh, so that, uh, you know, I can uh, walk you through the museum if you want to and, and uh, probably talk too much uh, while you're trying to look at things. <laughs> but uh, I, would, I would love to, uh, uh, to, to give you a tour of the museum whenever you can make it down. And, uh, and I'm sure I'll probably see you at one or two of the Blair Centennial events, I'm sure. Okay. Great. Okay. Well, thanks so much, Denise. Okay. Have a good one. And uh, thanks to everybody for joining us and supporting the museum's work. Good night, everybody. We'll see you on episode two coming soon.